Hey guys, before we start, I got some news. I collaborated with my good friend Colin from Entertainment, and we talked about our top 10 A24 films. I'll link the video below. Also, me and him started a strictly movie video essay only channel called The Ego Essayist. And we're also starting a podcast. It's called The Cool Guys Cast, where we discuss a movie and an album. I hope you guys check those out, and please subscribe to Entertainment. Alright, on with the video. Hey, hello, got another list video for you. Kind of. I'm stealing this idea from many different people, but you know what? I like movies too. So much so that I too have a favorite movie for every year that I've been alive. 23 to be exact. I'm going to stop at 2019 though, because 2020 isn't done yet, fuckers. But in case any of you are wondering what my favorite movie of the year so far is, it's never rarely, sometimes always. I made an entire video on it, I'm really proud of it, it's one of my most viewed on the channel so far, Eliza Hitman responded to it, yeah, check that out. So for this year, I feel a little bad for leaving some movies out, so I'm gonna add a few honorable mentions for each year leading up to the biggest honorable mention, and then my favorite. I this video may be long, so let's just jump in. Nineteen ninety six fucking sucked. What came out this year? The, the, what am I gonna talk about? Independence Day? No, I don't. Don't even defend that movie. That movie sucks. Space Jam. Okay, Space Jam is the best movie ever made, but of course it isn't my favorite. G God, fuck this year and fuck me for being born in nineteen ninety six. All right, I actually gotta pick an honorable mention. I really enjoyed Todd Salons's Welcome to the Dollhouse. He's known for his very bizarre and uncomfortable view on life, and this is no exception. It's definitely not for everyone, but I find it really funny. My favorite movie of 1996, however, is Fargo. Yeah, why wouldn't it be? The Coen brothers executed this story in such a unique way. Being able to balance so many different tones to this, at one point it's insanely dark, but then there's points where it's just unapologetically goofy, it starts to make fun of its dark nature, even down to making fun of the Minnesotan accents, which throughout the movie is very exaggerated. But even with all of that, the tension doesn't let up. Each character is developed in a way that you wouldn't expect. Some are better than you expect, and some are way more evil than you expect. It's very clever writing, and I honestly can't think of a scene or even a shot that feels misplaced. The Coens have always been so good at putting you in this atmosphere in developing characters, and this I think is one of their best. 1997 was thankfully way better than 1996. Life is beautiful, goodwill hunting, lost highway, perfect blue, and of course, Good Burger. But the biggest honorable mention goes to Boogie Nights. In one of his earliest films, Paul Thomas Anderson proves to us how amazing he is as a director. If you're not hooked by the opening five minutes, then I don't know what to tell you. This is one of the most entertaining movies ever. But my favorite movie of 1997, however, is Wong Kar Wai's Happy Together. I talked about this in my favorite movies video, and if you saw that, then you know that this is in my top 10 favorite movies of all time. For those who don't know, this is about a couple that goes on vacation only to start growing apart from each other and the emotional weight that this movie makes you carry is very overwhelming. This is one of the most devastating movies I've ever seen and these performances truly carry this movie. The anger and heartbreak they portray just by the look in their eyes is heartbreaking and you know exactly what's going to happen, but you can't help but to dread it. The way these characters are developed and performed builds up to this ending perfectly, but it still absolutely hurts. No matter how much my heart was heavy because of this, I couldn't help but to only notice the beauty of it all. This movie hurts, but it's simultaneously comforting in the most beautiful way. It's like crying because you're so scared of losing the one that you love. But then having someone put a blanket around you and giving you a hug. 
happy to get her a special. 1998 was great as well. Maybe even better than 97. Let's see what we got. We got The Big Lebowski, The Thin Red Line, The Truman Show, Saving Private Ryan, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, but the biggest honorable mention is going to Buffalo 66. I feel weird mentioning this because on the surface, this is the most by-the-numbers stereotypical independent movie to ever exist. But holy fuck, it's so beautiful. Almost every element of filmmaking is done to perfection, and the tap dancing scene is one of my favorite scenes in all of cinema. But of course, my favorite movie of 1998 is Wes Anderson's Rushmore. Anyone that knows me knows that Wes Anderson is my all-time favorite director, and even for one of his earliest movies, his fingerprints are all over it. He really commits to his style and humor, and Rushmore is no exception to that. This is one of the best scripts I've ever read. It is so goofy and very rarely takes itself seriously, but there's still a lot of development for these characters. Throughout the movie, you find out more about them and what they've been through, and it makes you realize why they would act the way that they act, but it still manages to hold on to that goofy tone. Just like in every Anderson movie, his attention to detail is amazing, and Max Fisher is one of my favorite characters in all of film. Is it the most indated film? No, but I'll always love it. Jeez, post-1996, movies were just getting better and better? 98 might still be my favorite in the later half of the 90s decade, but 1999 is still fucking great. Election, Eyes Wide Shut, Magnolia, Rosetta, Toy Story 2, The Straight Story, The Green Mile, Inspector Gadget, but the biggest honorable mention is going to the Virgin Suicides. I believe this was Sofia Coppola's full-length directorial debut, and the amount of heart in this movie is so heavy and beautiful, yet this is also one of the most depressing movies I've ever seen. Trust me when I say this is also one of the most engaging movies out there. Once you're in, you're in. The first time I saw this movie, I was absolutely hooked within the opening shot. But another movie that hooked me was my favorite movie of 1999, Spike Jonze's Being John Malkovich. I talked about this movie in my favorite movies video as well, and honestly, it's best to go into this movie not knowing much, so I'm just gonna repeat what I said, because it's kind of hard to review this. This is one of the weirdest yet oddly satisfying movies I've ever seen. This was Spike Jonze's directorial debut, and he tackles the themes of fame, identity, anxiety, finding your place in the world, feeling lost, pretty much everything beautifully, and the way all that escalated into just pure insanity makes it weirdly anxiety-inducing. Nothing ever looks real, but it's not meant to be, and you just have to roll with that. No one looks like a real human except for the celebrities but it's never executed in a way that feels pretentious. I'll just say this, there's a reason why Spike Jones is my second favorite director, and Charlie Kaufman is my favorite screenwriter. <music> 2000 was tough. It's a pretty mediocre year, but we got some great stuff. Oh Brother Where Art Thou, You Can Count On Me, Memento, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Rugrats in Paris, and my biggest honorable mention that isn't a meme, Chicken Run. I grew up in the British household because my dad and Nana are British, so growing up I was exposed to a lot of British cartoons and Aardman movies, and Chicken Run was one of the movies I watched the most. Now I'm not gonna say this is my favorite because of nostalgia, I really don't think that's proper criticism. I watched it again and again as an adult, and I still love it, it's so beautiful, it's so ridiculous, it's so funny. This is the epitome of just have fun with what you're given. But my favorite movie of 2000 is Juan Car Wise In The Mood For Love. This is one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen, both cinematography-wise and narrative-wise. This film soaks you in the color red, making it stand out more than any other color, and for some reason, it adds a lot to the emotional toll of the film. Like with Happy Together, which is the other Juan Car Wise movie that I love, you kind of know what's gonna happen, but that's what makes this so heartbreaking. It kind of teases you with it. 
For example, the chemistry that's set up with Chow and Sue is lightning in the bottle good. You buy this chemistry like it's the first time you're seeing love on screen, which is why the payoff is so heartbreaking. But it's simultaneously so rewarding too. It's rewarding because you get to witness the chemistry. It's rewarding because you've never seen love done quite like this. In the mood for love is so fucking powerful. Holy shit 2001. The Fellowship of the Ring. Mulholland Drive. Waking Life. Sexy Beast. Monsters Inc. The Royal Tenenbaums. And of course Dr. Doolittle too. But the biggest honorable mention goes to Spirited Away. I know you guys might want me to pick this as my favorite and it's very very close. There's just one other movie that I resonate more with, but it's all true. This is probably the most spellbinding animated movie ever made. See it in a theater if you can. I did, and it was more than an experience. Alright, the hate comments are probably going to come in now. My favorite movie of 2001 is Terry Zwigoff's Ghost World. I know this isn't for everyone, but I just love the quirkiness and for the most part relatability. I feel anyone can relate to the characters of Anita and Rebecca, feeling out of place in your own world to a point where you just kind of stop caring. And even if you don't relate to it, it does a great job of putting you in the perspective of these girls. Everyone around them pretty much seems like the most stereotypical example of a perfect person. They all seem the same at least to Anita and Rebecca. But when one of them befriends someone who seems different, you start to feel this kind of different outlook on life than you did before. Ghost World is very creative in that matter, and that's mainly due to the fantastic direction from Terry Swigoff and the performances from Scarlett Johansson and especially Thor Birch, who has the best arc in the movie. I don't want to give too much away, but if this seems like your thing, please give it a watch. Doesn't too fucking sucked ass. What do we got? The Two Towers, Far From Heaven, 25th Hour, Spider-Man, uh, Eight-Legged Freaks? I don't know. I can't even think of a good meme movie for 2002. That's how shitty this year was. But my biggest honorable mention is Adaptation. This is one of the most confusing movies ever, but like, it's so relatable and so, so good. Like, this is one of my favorite movies. Like, what the fuck? But my favorite movie of 2002 is, of course, Punch Trunk Love. This is my favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movie, and in my opinion, his most rewatchable. Paul Thomas Anderson put so much detail into this movie that every time I watch it, I feel like I still haven't fully caught up. And I've seen this movie a lot. But from what I did take from it, I think this movie is about finding the strength within you and using that strength to get what you truly want out of your life. And for Barry's case, what he wants is to be in love and to be happy with his life. Barry is one of my favorite characters in film history, and Adam Sandler's performance of him is one of my top 10 favorite performances ever. He gives the character of Barry so many layers, he's such a tragic character, but he has so much hope and strength in him, and throughout the whole thing, you can truly see that. The movie genre bends in the most creative way at times. It's a goofy movie, at times it's depressing as fuck, at times it's intense, at times it's hopelessly romantic, but strangely enough, it always feels tonally consistent. Punch Drunk Love is different, but different in the best possible way. Two thousand three was Yeah, sure, why not? We got Kill Bill, Old oh Boy, Triplets of Belleville, School of Rock, Memories of Murder, The Return of the King, The Haunted Mansion. But my biggest honorable mention is going to Jim Jarmusch's Coffee and Cigarettes. I never thought that an hour and a half long movie that's just non-stop random conversations could be so weirdly intriguing. But my favorite of 2003 easily goes to Sofia Coppola's Lost in Translation. I feel so stupid for not putting this in my favorite movies list. 
I rewatched it just recently having only seen it in college once, and honestly I can't stop watching it now. There's something so beautifully mysterious about this movie. The way it looks feels like there's so much going on. I can tell Sophia took advantage of every frame and the sound in general, but you still feel this calm and collective vibe of it all, if that makes sense. Everything around the characters kind of feels like it's trying to give you some kind of psychedelic feel, and the chemistry between Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson feels so raw and electric. It's that kind of chemistry where you have doubts that it could work at first, but then it works like magic. When Bill is with Scarlett, you can feel the happiness that he's been personally longing for, and it's a really beautiful feeling. And that all has to do with Sofia Coppola's amazing script and amazing direction. I don't know, it's hard to review Lost in Translation without going into full essay mode, so I'm just gonna end it here, but trust me, it's a masterpiece. 2004 was dope! The Incredibles, Primer, Anchorman, Vera Drake, Napoleon Dynamite, Sideways, the Spongebob movie, and I actually mean that in the most genuine way. You know, I I'm done with the meme movies, the, the movies that I mentioned that are obviously bad. It it it's not funny anymore. But the biggest honorable mention is going to Before Sunset. Everyone knows my love for the Before trilogy. It's by far my favorite trilogy of all time. And this is honestly my favorite sequel ever made and top three endings I've ever seen in a movie. But my favorite of 2004 is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Obviously. This is my second favorite movie of all time. And I went very in depth with this movie in my favorite movies video. So if you want more of an analytical view, check out that video. Here's the time code to skip to. But for now, I'll just say this is probably my favorite screenplay of all time. The attention to detail in this movie floors me to this day. And even to this day, I feel like I can't describe this movie justice, no matter how much I try. Charlie Kaufman and Michelle Gondry's vision of love is so brutally honest and kind of despairing. But at the same time, it's incredibly comforting and sweet. I've never seen love portrayed like this in a movie before, and watching it unfold the way it did felt pretty satisfying at least for me. And the performances from Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet help elevate it. Jim Carrey especially, who does an amazing job putting you in the psychological perspective of his character. Anyway, I could go on and on about this, but just know there's nothing I would change about it. 2005 existed, and it was cool for the most part. We got Cache, A History of Violence, Capote, Grizzly Man, Broken Flowers, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, The Squid and the Whale, but the biggest honorable mention goes to Thank You for Smoking. This is one of the most creative satires I've ever seen. It is so committed to its fake message that it might actually fool you a few times. Watch the movie and you'll see what I mean. But my favorite movie of 2005 is easily Brokeback Mountain. This is one of the most beautiful love stories ever put on film in my opinion. The entire atmosphere feels so accepting and warm. Within the first few minutes, you immediately grasp the tone and the story just starts and you learn so much about the environment and these characters by the first time you meet them and it doesn't break that tone throughout the whole movie. Jill Hall and Ledger were so committed to these performances it genuinely feels like they're in love and the connection is so strong that by the time the emotional core of the film hits it hits so hard and it never fails to break my heart every time I watch it. Also, The Wings is probably my favorite movie theme. If you were to ask someone what love sounds like, it would almost sound exactly like The Wings. It's the most beautiful song ever, in my opinion. 
2006. Blech. We have Borat, Inland Empire, The Departed, Casino Royale, Children of Men, Marie Antoinette, The Prestige, Half Nelson. But the biggest honorable mention is going to Bon Joon Ho's The Host. Can you believe that this movie invented suspense? But of course my favorite movie of all time, Little Miss Sunshine, came out in 2006. So of course that's my favorite. I like what I said in my favorite movies video. So if you want my in-depth thoughts, go to that. I know I've been saying that a lot, but like, this is my favorite movies for every year I've been alive. What, what can I say about this movie that I haven't said already? Two thousand seven was sexy, like holy shit. Ratatouille, super bad, hot rod, the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford, Water Lilies, Lars and the Real Girl, The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. But the biggest honorable mention is going to There Will Be Blood. People have heard me obsess over this movie and who can blame me? This is one of the most riveting films ever made and I'm pretty sure it invented filmmaking. But my pick for my favorite is No Country for Old Men. I will never forget the first time that I saw this. I will never forget because I genuinely wasn't prepared for how brutally realistic this film was. Most movies have characters or certain lines of dialogue that are witty and clever, but this has none of that. It's quite possibly one of the darkest films I've ever seen. In fact, if there's one word I can use to describe it, it's haunting. The use of silence, the lack of emotion on every character, the empty setting, Javier Bardem's show-stopping performance gives the movie such a haunting, hopeless atmosphere throughout. But it's never in your face about it. There are times where you think our main character could make it out okay. There are times where hope could be had but then reality kicks in. It's riveting. No Country for Old Men isn't like most other movies. It's haunting in the most beautiful way. The Coen brothers seriously know how to make their audience think, whether that be being really goofy, depressing, or uncomfortable. No Country for Old Men from frame one is its own thing. Two thousand eight was like the most inconsistent year. Milk, Hunger, Dear Zachary, Burn After Reading, Four Months, Three Weeks, and Two Days, Savages, In Bruges. But the biggest honorable mention, Hate Me If You Want, is going to Wally. -E. This is my favorite Pixar movie, and one that I think is actually very important and mature for children and adults. But my favorite movie of 2008 is The Dark Synecdoche, New York. Yeah. I made a pretty long review on Letterboxd and I'm pretty proud of it, but I don't want to repeat it. You can just check that out on your own. Point is, it pretty much sums up how I feel, but I'm gonna try my best to describe this movie with as little detail as I can. This gave me such a different view on life. It's very despairing and hopeless throughout, but it's also trying to give you as much understanding as possible. How can I put this? It's brutally honest in its execution, but the payoff feels like it's something you really need to hear, because it's something that everyone goes through, and there just comes a point in life where you just need to accept it. Charlie Kaufman is known for putting a lot of detail in his movies, but the attention to detail specifically in Synecdoche, New York is so fucking insane. If you miss one portion of this movie, you might miss the whole movie, because there's so much going on in every frame, it's pretty overwhelming. Within the first 10 minutes, you know so much about this family, and you immediately understand how important time is to the movie. In the opening 10 minutes and throughout the movie in general, days go by in a matter of seconds. It throws so much at you, but it never feels pretentious. It, this might be the worst review ever, but can you blame me? This is honestly the hardest movie I've ever had to review without going into full detail. But you know, I don't understand it. I may never understand it. 
but I definitely felt the support. I definitely felt like I heard what I needed to hear. I'll just say this, Charlie Kaufman and Spike Jones are my favorites for a reason. 2009 makes me blush, let's talk about it. Two lovers, Mary and Max, mother, inglorious bastards, a single man, a serious man, fish tank. But the biggest honorable mention is going to Duncan Jones' Moon. Honestly, if I had never seen this movie or my 2010 pick, I probably wouldn't be talking to you guys today. Moon was the movie that inspired me to get into filmmaking. But my favorite is Wes Anderson's Fantastic Mr. Fox. This is my favorite animated movie of all time. It uses its visuals and the physicality of the actors, and yes, I do mean physicality of the actors. These actors record their voices while acting out their scenes in real life to tell a compelling and genuinely funny story about accepting defeat and how things might not always turn out how you planned. It's a pretty deep and mature message for kids, but the way it's executed is with its goofy Wes Anderson-y type fashion. It has a goofy, whimsical score that's one of my favorite scores of all time, that feels like it's pulled right out of an old children's adventure story. The scenery and animation in general has a very children's picture book type feel, and again has a very goofy vibe to it. But it all works so well. Even with a message like accepting defeat, it's never too emotionally sentimental. I can't think of one moment in this movie that's taken seriously at all. It has so much fun with this family friendly material that every time I watch this, the runtime goes unreasonably fast because the energy never lets up. And even with all of that, the message somehow still hits pretty hard. I want to live inside this movie. Alright, I decided to make this video two parts, so that's the end of part one. I'll talk about 2010 through 2019 in part two, which should be out in the next couple of days. Anyway, thank you for watching, and please subscribe to The Ego Essayist, and look out for my podcast, The Cool Guys Cast, and check out Colin and I's Top 10 A24 Films video, and please subscribe to him. I'll leave a link to the video down below. Alright, have a good night guys, and part 2 will be out very soon.